Hello, I'm Paul. I'm Adam. And I'm Ben. And welcome to the Film Busters Podcast. The film show with no filters, no prisoners taken, loads of disagreements, but one hell of a love for cinema. If you want to hear three friends ridiculing each other for an hour or so regarding their taste in films, then you have come to the right place. In each episode, one of the team picks a film for us to discuss. It could be anything from a recent cinema release to an all-time classic. So, strap in and get ready to get mad or get vindicated as we guide you through the murky world of being a film geek. If you like what you hear, you can also find us on Twitter and Instagram using at FilmBustersPod. You can also find each of our individual accounts. I'm at FilmBustersPaul. I'm at FilmBustersAdam. And I'm at FilmBustersBen. If you want to use your eyes instead of your ears, you can also visit the website at filmbusterspod.co.uk. And if busting makes you feel good, you can also support us at patreon.com forward slash filmbusters for exclusive content. All right, can we just get on with this now, please? Filmbusters. So I received a lovely little gift in the post the other day, and um, it was for my birthday. My birthday is not for another two or three weeks. Um, but I uh, got a lovely early birthday present from the young fine film Paul from Film Busters. Film Paul bought me a <laughs> young John and Paul, fine. The Film Buster, John Paul the Film Buster, and he bought me a lovely, lovely back around blind muck. Oh, wonderful! It How's wonderful. the tea tasting out of that? It's tasting very good. I'm currently drinking from it now. While we do the, you can hear the sip, sip, sip. Oh, oh beautiful oh, SRM smokes! People in here. It does look very nice. It's got like a nice little red handle and like it's a red very, rim. Yes. The, the the print is completely solid onto the mug. There's no bumps of where it's been. So it feels very high quality. I trust well, that you've put this in a dishwasher many, many times in life. Is it a, is it a American style mug, big, or a UK style mug? I'll say it's probably UK. It's a decent size. Yeah. I think I think it's a, a German company that does Ooh. it. So oh, yeah, the Germans do everything European. big though. European. It did um, come from Germany. Cup. It said on the bottom of the muffin. On the bottom of the post, it did say that it you was. You said the bottom of the muffin. <laughs> on the bottom of the p- p- package. Oh. Um, a a, a uh, Brazilian film inspired a UK term to produce a German mug. It's very international. This baccarat blind thing. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, yeah, because nice. this, this is coming from our new merch range. Basically, we got we got a new shop, guys. We're printing our back around blind. I think it's probably the best, you know, the best form of our um, uh, advertising our podcast, really, because it's not too obvious. It's a nice little in reference. It's an in reference for and sure. It's just a nice little design. Yes, yes it's, it's very nice mug. Mm. One of our I'm patrons the other like day it. had a, ho- a hoodie. Yes, Mr. Jamie Russell. We know that we know that somebody else has bought a T-shirt. Me? We don't know. <laughs> that was Paul. Oh, that was you. <laughs> Okay, I thought there was another surprise person that bought one. I got a very. Uh, let me tell you a story about this. Actually, I I uh I got a t-shirt. Yes, it's a. It was like a baseball style t-shirt. It was very nice. Got like the um, like do you know, it's got like the black shoulders, and the rest of the t-shirt's white. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So it's got the nice backer up line print on it, and I wore it first day. Cooked dinner, spilled all my dinner down it, didn't I? Of course. And then I went to to get some dog food out of the shed. And I tore it on a nail. Oh, you're joking. Yeah, on the back. So pissed off. <laughs> so Man. pissed off. Man, this is, the, this is the problem. We're getting the old white shirts. You, it, where I can, I try and avoid the white shirts. So most of my T-shirts are, are black with something on. But then I re- realized for a long while, I was like, I just own too much black T-shirts. So let me buy some white ones. So over the last nine months, I bought a bunch of white ones. Every white shirt I've had now has a stain in it. It's true. When mm, the, it's true. I bought a Jamie Lee Curtis shirt, the first time I wore it out, Adam was there. We went to this uh, festival over here in Crystal Palace. I s- spilled all this red drink down me. I don't even know what the red drink yeah, was. But you were very, very, very drunk. You should shirt. not have been wearing that white T-shirt at that environment. Nevertheless, Pearl Jam shirt, white shirt. The uh, next time I wore it, curry down it. Of course. White shirts just attract carnage. You must. They just expect you, it. But it's it's just like the mess is also on them black shirts. It's just it gets hidden. Yeah, of course. You can just walk around dirty. It's fine. Yeah. Mm. I like to wear the all black anyway. It makes me feel like Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails. Well, guess what? What? You can buy a fucking Baccarat Blind black t-shirt if you wanted to because there's all colours, all ranges on there. We Look don't discriminate that. against just having white t-shirts. How much is a t-shirt? 
How much is white t-shirt? It's cheap. It's cheap. It's probably if, with 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 postage. It's probably just over twenty quid. Okay, that's all right. Everyone's going. That's not fucking cheap. <laughs> It's okay though, isn't it? It's, if you're going fucking Primark, it's fucking expensive. It's, it's a reasonable <laughs> price. You won't find our stuff in Primark because I'll bomb them and blow them up. Jesus, you want to keep that on the podcast? Yeah, keep it. <laughs> but anyway, for the, for those people who don't have a fucking clue what we were talking about, like if you're new to the podcast, the back around blind is a term that has been coined to explain... We watched a film a couple of years ago called Baccarat that we knew nothing about before watching. And it spawned the term Baccarat Blind, which means going into a film knowing little to nothing about it. We don't mean like something like Top Gun, Maverick, mm. where, oh, I've avoided the trailers. We mean you literally know fucking nothing. Who's in it, what it's about, nothing. You it's it's best with a film that's like shrouded in mystery that you kind of get to unfold in front of you that's like, oh, God, I didn't expect that. That yes. kind of film. And then you can go back around blind with us too on some things. What is the uh, film that you've gone into back around blind? What, what's been the best back around blind experience of your film lives? Would you two say a film you know nothing about? And is the a best film? I feel our film busters' lives, or in no, no, just in any time. Your number one, something you one know that always about. stands out for me is a film called The Guilty. The, um, is it Swedish or Danish? Or the Guilty. It's Danish, oh isn't yeah, it? yeah, 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 yeah. And. Um, yeah, I literally knew nothing. I just put it on and it was really good. That's true. And then I remember watching it because you liked it so much. I, I would yeah. personally have to have to say Baccarat because that it's where it's come from, but that is just it's just a wonderful film and it just it's just wild where that film goes. It's a yes. fucking UFO in it at some point. <laughs> I would say Lane, but I knew nothing about that one. Yeah. At all. Other than the sentence description that was on a nondescript oh, wow. VHS in my uni library. It was like one sentence. Three kids in the ghettos of Paris after a riot 24 hours. I was like, okay. Mm, beautiful. I need to. Yeah. I haven't watched something so long, I need to watch it again. Oh, come on. Make sure you get the original translation. Oh, yes, yes. That new American translation, I'm not keen on. It's made me feel funny about it. Oh, no. <sighs> oh, yes, 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 yes. Anyway. Anyway. Should we tell everyone what we're doing today? Yeah, we've been far too silly for too long. Okay, well, this is a very silly film, so we should be fit. We should be being silly. It's fine. But today, what are we doing? It's my pick. We're doing Kindergarten Cop, another Arnold Schwarzenegger film. He's returning to the podcast once again. How it's many times have we had him on this now? Well, you'll find out soon when I tell you all the films he's been in. <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> But, yes, he's back again. It's the round of 1990. We covered Misery. Jamie Russell kicked that, this round off with Misery. And now we're on to Kindergarten Cop. But first of all, before we actually start talking about this film, let me just say we got a patron channel at www.patreon.com forward slash filmbusters where you can come on and suggest what round you want us to do and what film you want us to do. You can kick some whole year off on the podcast and it's very wonderful. And we have exclusive content on there. And we just have a lovely little family. It's very wonderful. And what are we doing after this episode on the Patreon, guys? So after this, we are going to talk about our top five female antagonists in films. Yes, indeed. Who's, who suggested this, Ben? Jamie, please. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Arnie. He decided to show up. But yes, Jamie Russell, he, he suggests on the back of his Misery episode because we love our, we love our patrons. We want them to get what, exactly what content they want. And this content today will be our top five female antagonists in film. I'm very excited yes. to hear what you guys have to, guys have to say. I know. Well, we're going to be talking about them antagonists. And I look forward to talking about it as a carryover from Misery. Hells to the yes. Should we move on to the staple of every episode, Ben? Yes, we're going to move on to the staple of every episode. We're going to do the quiz. It's been a while since I did the quiz for you boys because Scott and Jamie took over the reins of doing it for the last uh, last couple of episodes. But yeah. now I'm going to be doing it with the help of someone. I would like to just get to know you. That's true. <laughs> That's what he wants to do with this quiz. He's a nice Amazing. guy. He just wants to get to know people. Yeah. I want to ask you a bunch of questions. Oh, okay. I want to have them answered immediately. I will try. We'll try our best, I guess. I'm yeah. speaking for myself anyway, not Adam. Um, although he's just lost his voice, so actually I will be the one asking the questions. Oh, very good. <laughs> so, Get sorry, a little honey, sit, sit down. 
Get a little <laughs> cough syrup in you. So for those who don't know, when we do this episode, we do a little quiz where I ask the boys two questions. If they get the questions right, they get a point. If they get them wrong, I get the point. Currently, the scores are Paul has 28 points. I'm in second place with 22 and Adam's in third place with 21. We are now at the point where every point counts because we've only got a couple of months left of the year. So here come two questions. Here's the first question. I hope you boys were paying attention. The question is... What is the final financial offer Chris makes for the man's remote control car track? Four times the amount of what it costs. And what is that? Four hundred dollars. Incorrect. Is there a price? The final on it? offer. He says the the amount. Oh, when he uh, approaches him outside the shop. Correct, Adam. Oh, well done. Is it actually two hundred dollars? Okay, I guess that. But. There Look at you that. go. That's a question. Good guessing. Well done. Adam's up onto my level. Now then, we're going to... I am going to ask you to complete the um, the lyric from this song. Okay. Are you ready? Yes. I'm going to pause it, and the minute I pause it, feel free to shout out the lyric. Oh, okay. Um, it's not a tumor. That's not the complete line. I will tell you the lyrics. I will tell you the lyrics leading up to it, okay? And respect you'll give me, ludicrous. I live loud like Timmy. Fuck, have to clear these rumors. I don't know. Never heard this song in my life, so I wouldn't know. <laughs> Have to clear it's science to do with tumors. Right? It's science to do with tumors. I'll play. I will play it. There, there you oh, go. Well, I pretty much said it. How I know, it's but not it was a tumor. not the complete line. It was not a complete line. So I shall get the points, and that's points for me and points for Adam. That was ludicrous with Missy Elliott from Gossip Folks, which was fucking huge in the day. How have you boys mm. not heard that song before? That would play everywhere. I, I didn't listen to that kind of music back in the day. I listened to rock music. You couldn't avoid listening to that, mate. It was played everywhere. I never heard it in my life. Luda. Anyway, ludicrous. So that's a point for Ben and a point for Adam. That means we're making our marches. You're making Paul. movements. We're making movements. Paul is on 28, his shortest lead ever, because now I'm on 23 and Adam's on 22. We are getting close. We are getting close. Anyway, should we move on to the film? Now let's everybody say good morning, Mr. Kimball. Good morning, Mr. Kimball. Good morning. They're all yours. I'll be watching you. Hi. How are you? I'm very happy to be here. First, I would like to just get to know you. <laughs> ha, 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 ha. Quiet. I want to ask you a bunch of questions. And I want to have them answered immediately. Right, everyone, today we are doing Kindergarten Cop from Ivan Reitman. It's a film from 1990. This is a spoiler episode, so if you haven't seen this film, you might want to go watch it first, then come back, and we can spoil it for you, because that's what we're going to do immediately. First of all, let me just tell you some people who have been in stuff we've done before on the podcast. It's yes. me! Yes, it is <laughs> you, Arnie. But what films have you been in? I'm a Terminator. Yes, which one, though? I'm a cop, you idiot! Uh, I'm a construction no. worker. There's, I'm a friend of Sierra Connor. I'm Detective yes. John Kimball. He's that's all of those what, things. That's today. <laughs> he's all of those things. Well, only two of the things you mentioned related to one film he's done before. Well, he he can't be prattling off all the f names of films he's been in. <laughs> Predator. <laughs> yes, Predator. That is one of them. Which Terminator was it? Sauerkraut. That's it. <laughs> Terminator, Terminator Sauerkraut. Sauerkraut. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, which one was he really cool in? What? 
come on, guys. Which oh, one yeah. was he the coolest of cooling? I can't find I can't find a thingy here for that he one. He was a he was a cold motherfucker. I know, but I can't find a. Oh, okay, a... You're, tr you're trying to find a. Is it is is Adam just blanking? I I'm blanking. Yeah. Oh, how are you blanking? You I fucking can't... picked the film. I know. Oh, hang on. We could do this one. You cold blooded bastard. That's the closest. That's the closest. Come on, Adam. Oh, what with Mr. Batman and Robin? Yeah, Batman and Robin. Congratulations. I forgot he was in there. Lovely. Anyway, we've got three other people. We've got Linda Hunt, who plays the head teacher. She was in Solo. I don't remember being in it. She was in Solo, okay. was she? Yeah, yeah. We've got Carol Baker, who plays the mum of Crisp. She was the maid in the game. Oh, wow. Fucking yeah, hell. Michael How Dugs demeaning for her to go yeah. from uh, being quite prominent in Kindergarten Cop to that bit part in the game. Yeah, yeah. And then we have Kathy Moriarty, who plays the rich mum, who they suspect at some point. She's in Copland. I don't remember her being in Copland either. Oh, wasn't she um, Ray Liotta's wife? Potentially. Potentially. I yeah, don't remember. I think so. I think so. Well, that's it. That's everyone we've done before. Look at that. Adam, what is the plot of this film? All right. So you got Arnie, or Mr. Kimball, who is a cop. And he is chasing down a man called Mr. Crisp. Um, I'm Detective John Kimball. Exactly, and uh, and in order to infiltrate him and get him in prison, they need to get his wife to testify. So, my Arnie wife goes undercover in a school and infiltrates his child to try and find out and get the mum to testify, and then it all goes off. Now, please get your mother. That's it. That's all you need to say. Yeah. Arnie said it in we'll one, about the literally one line, and, yeah. and you took ages. <laughs> the police get your mother. That is the <laughs> plot description. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. Benny, do you have anything to say about this film? Reading, writing, arithmetic. Too much homework makes me sick. When it's time to pass the test, kindergarten is the best. Yeah. So, I will tell you a few cool things about the film. So, um... Let me get to the top of my comments here. So Kindergarten Cop was initially offered to Bill Murray, Patrick Swayze and Danny DeVito, who all turned the titular role down. Uh, Penelope Ann Miller was very reluctant to take on the role as she had just come off doing a bunch of theatre shows. She'd been working with Robert De Niro in, in Awakenings and she saw working with Schwarzenegger as being a bit of a step down and the wrong direction for her career. But uh, but then she saw the movie and she was like, actually, that was the right call. Um, the film was shot on location in Astoria for the most part in a school with all the, the kids who were extras being paid $35 a day to just carry on in the background and Arnie insisted a gym be built on location at the school so that he could keep up with his regular workouts um, but Schwarzenegger actually felt that the violence in the film was very costly he basically estimated I don't know how he estimated this because I don't know what financial brain he has but he thinks that the violence in the film cost the film about 25 million dollars in box office receipts he said it should have reached the exact same audience as twins which made over 110 million dollars oh this is how he worked out kindergarten cop made 85 million but despite that it's actually his favorite of all his films if you can believe oh. that all his films and that's time stamped to last year him saying that and here's something. Short Terminator. <laughs> well, well, there you go. He obviously <laughs> loves he, he loves what happened with Kindergarten Cop. Um, Schwarzenegger is also a big ferret hypocrite, boys. Because in the movie, obviously, Kimball has a, a ferret. Yeah. But yeah. in California, owning a ferret as a pet has been illegal since the 1930s. And in 2004, the state passed a bill dropping that ban. But then Schwarzenegger, who was governor at the time, vetoed it. Ensuring mm. that owning a ferret maintains being illegal. What do you say? What do you say to that? What do you think that means about his stance on being ferret? I tried to read into it. Basically, if he supports a ban on people owning ferrets, do you think that means he hates ferrets or no, I he say loves means ferrets? He he loves ferrets because he doesn't want he just wants them to be wild. But this is the man who owns fucking Shetland pony and all sorts. Mm. He's got that I beautiful like pony. Yeah, I don't know. If it is a I pony, it might be another thing. 
I feel like horses are one of those things where you can really look after them because they just stand there and eating grass otherwise. <laughs> Yeah, but horses <laughs> could be considered more wild, right? I know you'd think so. His pony yeah. eats looking whiskey and cigar- cigars, isn't it? It doesn't eat the cigars. <laughs> <laughs> the pony's pony's called whiskey, I think. Oh, okay. There was a real cute. Thing. No, one of them, no, it's called. Um, what's his character in? What is it called? Um, Dutch, isn't it? Dylan, you son of a bitch. Yeah. No, I think his pony's called whiskey. I think. I'm going to Google this now. I'd say he likes ferrets. Because they're not very... They're not he's really an animal a domesticated lover, animal. So. It's not a domesticated animal, so he feels like they shouldn't be domesticated. Whiskey. His miniature horse is called Whiskey, and his donkey's called Lulu. Uh, um, so who knows why he doesn't like ferrets. <laughs> <laughs> Just default into he doesn't. I mean, very, an amnest, uh, I'm trying to work out if it means he likes ferrets or not. This is the whole podcast is going to be until Arnie writes into us and tells us whether he likes ferrets or not. Yes. In fact, let's not do the research. Listeners, go and see if you can find out Arnie's stance on ferrets. And if you can find it out definitively where he stands on ferrets, you'll get some sort of thing happening to you in the near future. (laughs) That could be anything. (laughs) You'll get something happening to you. (laughs) I don't like to commit to anything. That could be a really great gift or a very troubling gift. <laughs> well, who says it's a gift? It could just be something that happens. You could just receive a, a DM from us saying congrats. Oh, well, it's not going to be that now because you revealed it. No, but it will be better than that, folks. So please. Well, that's tantalizing, guys. You should you find this information out. <laughs> come on, listeners. The, something will happen to the listener who finds it out. <laughs> so please do it. Please. Jamie. <laughs> Jamie, please. please. <laughs> Reading, writing, arithmetic. Right. This is my pick. So yes. I get to decide what order we do our first impressions in. I'm going to go first, then it's going to be Ben, and then it's going to be Adam. How about that? Okay. So I'm okay. going second. Yes, yeah, so you're second. Good so Lord. I'm going to say Arnie is amazing in this film, and the one liners are endless and. Mostly the lines that get out, read out of the soundboard <laughs> anyway. It <'cause that> <laughs> yeah. feels like the whole film is just the soundboard that you always do. Um, the story's silly fun and may, it's made even better by like the transformation of Arnie. Like from the beginning, he's like this rugged man. <laughs> and then it's, it's transformed into this clean shaven substitute teacher. It's glorious. I love mm-hmm. seeing that. I've never seen him so rugged as he is at the beginning of this film. With all that sweat and that stubble. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. very lovely. Well, the, that beard looks glued on. I, mean, I always thought that, but I don't think I don't it is. Think I think so. it's all him. Why would he glue it on? Yeah. Anyway. But it, it does look glued on, yes. But uh, one of the most endearing things about this film for me, and it's only really, really dawned on me since watching it now with, with a child, is how good it is at getting that incredibly genuine viewpoint from a child. Like, half the stuff these kids are coming out with, Woody has said in one way or another. Like, for example, we've we've taught Woody the correct terms for genitalia, right? <laughs> so the other day... The important bit. He's sitting on his auntie's lap and he asks her if she has a vagina. <laughs> and then he proceeds to say, he's sitting on her vagina. <laughs> Ugh. <laughs> this is the disturbing innocence content. Of children, the innocence of children. <laughs> It's it's funny just for Arnie's outlandish comedy, and it's just as funny for its relatively odd things that kids come out with. It's a it's a really great watch, and would have only been made better if Val Kilmer was cast as Mister Crisp. Oh no, <laughs> fuck no, not a chance. I did think that at some point halfway through the film, I was like, "You looked so much like you could be him." Val Kil- Kilmer from Heat. Yeah, <laughs> man, Val Kilmer, man. I can't really stomach him. What a treasure. I don't know why you guys love him so much. Val Kilmer does really has no charisma in anything for me. He killed Batman. He's rubbish in heat. He's like a charisma vacuum in heat as well. No. No. He's not, he's not good in anything. Don't be silly. I also don't like men with long hair. Simple as. I just don't. Well, what do you think of this guy's hair? <laughs> yeah, well, he's a villain, and I, I, but he's a good enough actor for me to forgive the hair. Hmm. I think he could have easily replaced as an actor. I hate long hair on the gentleman. Mm. 
go on. First impressions from you. From it, from me. Yes. Listen, I'm not even going to hold it to the end because there's no point. This is the best film that we've covered all year on this podcast. This has been a 10 out of 10 film for me forever, and it continues to be. The reason it works perfectly is because it is a genre bouncer. It starts off being quite serious and gritty and violent. It's like a, a cop film in the traditional Arnie sense, where he's a big beefcake. And then it segues into this sort of buddy cop territory for about 15 minutes. And then we get all out comedy for an hour or so before returning to cop thriller buddy movie towards the end. And it's no mean feat for a single film to do that and make it consistent and, and to smoothly transition through all of those genre shifts. And it really does that for me because I believe I'm gripped from the off. I believe in the in the stakes that are set up at the beginning with Crisp. I believe in the stakes of that boyfriend um, being killed and then that girlfriend uh, killing herself because of the... Or not killing herself, being killed because of, of, of what she knows. And it's hard to maintain that while also seeing all these kids in class being kiddy and winding up Arnold Schwarzenegger. I love it. It's so funny. It's uh, infinitely quotable. It's Schwarzenegger's best, uh, one of his best performances ever. It's hands down his best comedy, without doubt his best comedy. And he did this very early in his career when he was still doing comedies because when he came over to America, he hit Conan up, but he was doing Twins. He was doing this. This was before Terminator 2. So he was mm-hmm. embracing that comedic aspect to his his roles very, very early, early on. And it was crucial for me to see him doing this. It makes so much more sense that he's doing it over like Bill Murray or Danny DeVito or, or whoever that other person was. It needed to be Schwarzenegger muscled up because the film is we've talked about this a little bit before but I think this is probably the ultimate and actually when I was at uni I did a little module on <clears throat> or a, a lesson on this specifically where they talked about this being a sort of transitory film for masculinity because it went from big beefcake muscles blowing things away men protecting protecting America protecting their country or what have you but not giving a fuck about their family whereas this softens the uh, masculine man makes him about family shows him wanting to care for kids wanting to preserve uh uh the sanctity of childhood and stuff like that and i love it for just subverting the idea of who schwarzenegger was it's the perfect fucking film it's wonderful i defy anyone to tell me a negative about this i would argue any negative about this because i simply do not see one in this film it's the perfect film hey adam do you want to argue a negative (laughs) here here he comes (laughs) So yeah, this is the third time I've watched this film now in probably the space of about 18 months. Um, so I got quite familiar with it. Um, the first time was with a mate, the second time it was just on TV and I put it on. And this is the first time I think I probably sat down and watched it in a, I don't know, in a critical environment, let's say. And I I know that Ben loves this film and I know you're probably going to come for me in this, but it is a really good film and I do really enjoy it. I don't really see many faults with it. I think my fault lies with just, I don't love it as much as you do. At the end of it, I'm like, okay, that was funny. That was all right. I listened to you talk about it then. It was quite nice. And I do, I do kind of agree with every point that you bring up, but I think it fundamentally comes down to you just love this film more than I do. I'm not going to argue on negative points and stuff, but... Oh, please do. But what's the worst thing about the film, Adam? Yeah. I don't think this is one of those films that I, you just like, you're not like, oh, there's, that was bad, that was bad. Like, when we sat through, we sat through films that I'm probably going to give the same rating as this, and I picked them apart and gone, I didn't like that, I didn't like that, I didn't like that. Whereas this, I don't think it comes down to that. I think it was just, oh, that's all right. That's a nice film. I had fun with it. It was good fun. It was, <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's fundamentally kind of it at the end of the day. Now, I recall a year ago or whenever it was you first time watched this, seeing your letterbox review and going mad because... I didn't give it a review, did I? No, no. The the star rating, sorry. It was low. Yeah, I gave it a six. Okay. You know what? I think that kind of makes sense because I don't think this is a film that you can watch like it with a group of people. No. I don't feel like that kind of film. It's not like you're watching like the ludicrousness play out and it's all funny and like you're laughing about it. It's just like, it's it's funny, but it's like you don't need other people around to tell you it's, <laughs> whether something's funny or not. No. But a six, I would say, that you didn't really enjoy that, I would say. 
I mean, my score's changed since then. The second time I watched it, okay. it changed. All right, and it might have changed again. Well, anyway, well, then fine. Okay, so, but basically, I do not see anything that would stop someone. I, I, I struggle to see what people could find fault with in this film. I would, I, I'm respect. not going to sit here and argue that this bit wasn't work, this bit didn't work for me. I'm talk, it's, not, it's not a film that is like that. It's a film I just... Yeah, I'm like, oh, that was good. But that's kind of it. Oh, I want you to give me something that we can <laughs> I, tussle I would over. Say, I, would, I would say this. I think the thing that do- stops this from, from getting to higher levels for me is Mr. Crisp. I don't, I don't think he's the greatest villain. If they had an actual like great actor in that role, they probably didn't have to do anything other than do exactly what he does in this film. But the fact that he's not a well-known actor, it kind of holds it back for me because I don't care that much about him. It, 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 he could be villainous and everything, but it's like when you have another actor facing off against another great actor, it just adds that extra level of wonderfulness for me. And that would have done wonders. Well, I tell you, I I do like him because he is sort of unknown. He's always struck me as very slimy and sleazy because of that slick back hair. Not knowing him from anything else at all, I only think of him as crisp. And I, I like that he has this double act with his mother. It's him and his mum. Almost like a Norman Bates relationship in a way because mm. she's so domineering and whatnot, like... You shoved all that stuff down my throat when I was a kid. There was nothing wrong with me. That's why there was nothing wrong with you. Now, how can you argue with that? That's who can who could deliver the line of that? That's mother. perfect. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that Mr. Crisp is so fucking manicured and and precise in the way that he's presented. I I love him as a villain. I like that he is the opposite of um, Arnie. He's not muscled up and beefed up or or manly in the traditional sense he's lean he's the opposite of traditional masculinity and i like i like that element because he's almost snake like you know he's always there in the background slithering around i like i like him i like him i think mm. i think he's good in his performance particularly when he comes through at the end of the school and he finds dominic and he's like oh dominic i'm your father look at me come on she, she's turned you against me like he's he's really acting well there i think um he, he doesn't just put in a off the page performance he's like I believe him. I believe he's desperate to get Dominic on board with him. He's so yeah. deluded all the way. Every time you see him, when, he, when he's talking to that guy, oh, my son loves uh, racetracks. He's going to love this. He's not, he doesn't think he's lying there. He believes it because for him, he has to get his son back. Mm. He's sure yeah. they're going to have the happy life afterwards. I think he plays it quite well. But I, I feel, can see your point about wanting a... Yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't name. necessarily think that he, he doesn't play it well. He like... The performance comes across, and he does a, a good villainous performance. But yeah, it's just, it's just. I think it's a little forgettable for me. He just, he doesn't bring anything that's like, wow, he was that was a great villain. Maybe when did you first watch it? Oh, I watched it years ago, years ago when I first watched it. But like, were you a, like preteen? Would you say? No, no, uh, yeah, I, no. I would have been like probably late teens by the time I watched it. I watched it with my mum when I was like, I don't know, I was a kiddie, a preteen, mm. and I remember that scene where Arnie falls asleep at the desk and the camera slowly pans around and Crisp is outside in the pouring oh, yeah. rain. And I remember being really scared by that. Oh, and really? I guess because I watched it as a kid, oh. even now, so that sort of is there in my head that he is a scary, scary villain. Okay. Like When I see him, I do get danger from him. Have you ever there, seen him in anything sense. else? Never. I had a look, actually, on IMDb to see what he, he'd done. He has done absolutely nothing that we would know. Mm. Certainly mm. nothing that I know. He, d- he did shit loads recently. Loads of these straight-to-streaming or straight-to-video action pieces and crap like that. Um, just trashy action movies and comedies. Yeah. Although he was in uh, something about Mary, but I don't know in what capacity. I mean, that goes to show something that he has never transcended from this role. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It works for me in this one. You know how it is, though. There's certain films that and you know. Everyone thinks it's Val Kilmer. Yeah, so like, if Val Kilmer was in this, it's not a big enough um, role for him. He he doesn't. They don't really get the showdown, the traditional showdown. They meet briefly at the beginning, very briefly, mm. and they meet very briefly at the end. But really, they're kept apart. 
they would have had made they would have had to have made the climax yeah, more about the two of them. Yeah, maybe bulked his performance out a bit more. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I know, but it just would have added a little bit more. I think that that always works wonders for me when it has that great villain against the great hero, like hence why Predator works so well for me because I absolutely love the look of Predator and fucking Arnie's there as well. That's why fucking Face Off works for me because you have that balance of the two amazing actors. It's just, it, I mean, it, yeah, it probably didn't need it mm. in this film, but that is just what holds it back for me. I don't. It's that one little element. I still think it's a fucking great film. It's fucking yes. funny and it's a great little setup for for an action film. Or it's is it an action film? Is it that much of an action film? <laughs> well, I think it's a new action film. I mm. think it's the new action film of the 90s. It, it comes, like, we, t- we have talked about it when we were talked about when we did our round on, with the game. We sort yeah, of talked yeah. about, like, mas- masculinity in crisis. We were talking about it being about traditional uh, masculine roles being in jeopardy in crisis. Mm, yeah. Whereas this, like, looking at this, this is not about masculinity in crisis. This is about redefining that traditional masculinity, which is what I dig. Obviously, when I was a kid, I wasn't thinking of it this way. But now, when I look at it, this is how I can, this is how I really appreciate it because it's like Arnie at that time being like, yes, I've done Predator. Yes, I've done Terminator. Yes, I've done Conan. I appreciate that that's how masculinity was defined. But now, here, here I'm going to use this beef case beefcake persona mm. and put me in an atmosphere where my muscles are completely redundant yeah. you go in undercover in a school for all your muscles you can't control these kids that's a funny conceit anyway so there's plenty of comedy to then be had out of that but also it really humanizes him because it strips away everything that normally when you watch an arnie film even though you're cheering for him there's a buffer there because you're like, well, you're not like me because look at you. You're superhuman. Yeah, yeah. But whereas you put him in that classroom and suddenly he's like us. And that's what is kind of nice about it. It's like, all oh, right, yeah, but we'd be the fucking same mm-hmm. in that situation. Um, that's quite great though. He's He obviously made a point of approaching those kind of roles, especially if yeah. so he's not pigeonholed as being this action kind of guy. And he goes along and does this and like twins and uh, junior. Yeah. It's like they, they, they require no muscles it doesn't matter None. about his build it's just funny that he is that build in that role <laughs> yeah that's kind of he, the comedy element that's the comedy element right like he literally they and they 100% keep setting it up from the minute he walks into that school and he meets the headmistress who they've cast that tiny yes. actress anyway great. <laughs> which is great I love her though <laughs> um, and when he walks into the classroom the way they shoot him and shoot the kids yeah it's such a high camera angle <laughs> brilliant it's, I mean it's 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 just great. He ha- he literally is stepping into his female partner's role there. It's like, well, she was meant to be doing it. Mm. She got sick. So you now become, in in the sense of the movie, you step into the woman's role and you go and do that. It's good, but not in a corny way. Not like, what what you get now? Or 10 years ago, Mr. Nanny and shit like that, or whatever they are. When yeah, they John tried it Cena with, has to be yeah. the Tooth Fairy or something like that. That's, That's it. I was about to say Tooth Fairy. They tried it a little bit with that. Yeah. And the reason it works in this film is because in a lot of films that would try and imitate this, you establish him as a bit of a machine at the beginning. Like, you don't just bring him in immediately and it's like, okay, throw him into this setting. Like Vin Diesel being thrown into something. In in this, we see him with a gun, firing shots, going after his suspect, pressing a witness treating kids like shit on the plane seeing what he can be like in the pursuit of justice and then you throw him into this setting like we've mm. actually seen some quite violent stuff and then absolutely like, and now we're going to put you with these tiny little kids it does and make me think like what is the age rate on this in some of the moments I know it, well I remember on VHS it was 15 yeah I don't know what yeah, it is makes now sense. Was it? Mm. yeah 15 we're not surprised if they brought it down to wow. a 12 maybe but it's still it's still quite violent and well you've got drug overdoses language. yeah yeah yeah. yeah. The language is there. You've got drug overdoses. He is firing shots at the beginning. Mm. I don't think he actually kills anyone because he's a cop. I'm sure he wasn't able to just... I think he just blasted a lot of things in that <laughs> opening killed, scene. He killed Crisp? Oh, yeah. at The the bad guy, yeah. Yeah, okay, right, right, right. Yeah. Well, you wouldn't normally find him killing... This is the thing. It's like people. you talking about this film like that again, I completely I, I completely agree with everything. And it is great to see and it is nice to nice to have these these films like that. But... Yeah, I just don't love the actual overall film as much well, as I think you do. 
And I think if it's that thing of like you, you kind of grow up with it as well. I'd imagine it, it helps a lot and all of those kind of things. But yeah, I think it just has a lot going for it beyond the the. Whether, well, if you, you know don't like if if it doesn't make you really laugh or if you're not really enjoying it, it doesn't matter. But it's just mm. like it may it really makes me laugh. I really care about the characters and the story. I think Schwarzenegger is just having the absolute time of his life in this performance as well, and it and it rubs off on me. Everything in this film is just good for me. I think that's where it sits at. I think I think what makes this film, and it would not be the same without this element, is Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's without him, 100%. this film would not work. Yeah, you no. put any other beefcake in this film, Dolph Lundgren. It's just not. It's just not the same. It's Arnie just has that. He's just magic in these roles. He yeah. he has that balance of he can be the tough guy, but the way he acts in these com- in comedy situations is just wonderful. The way he the way he delivers Truly. lines is fucking wonderful, and he he brings the magic. That is that is the magic in this film for me. There's no replacing him. They want, they have tried for the last decade or so to tell us that Dwayne Johnson is the new Arnie. He's not. No. He simply isn't. It, he has the build. Baptista is more of the new Arnie. Well, maybe there's a shout for that. But like, you know, Arnie, <laughs> he could turn his hand to any fucking thing, man, and, and we would be there for it. Yeah. He could do comedy and action so well. Mm-hmm. You got a good call there with with Batista, Adam, because Batista doesn't bring that kind of he's level. A tough, of, he's I know, a cheese, cuddly tough guy rather yeah, than yeah, cheese. The... Like he could, he, he he, you see him in like Blade Runner twenty forty nine, and he just he fits he fits in the narrative. If you put fucking Dwayne Johnson in there, it's like oh, there's something about him. It just he's so he's he is very Disney. He's very Disney. He is very Disney. He's like you cannot you can't really take him seriously. There's suddenly Dwayne, everything's him. suddenly a Dwayne film and he's in it. Yeah, he's a very but, powerful man. He's very <laughs> powerful in Hollywood. But you know, the other thing is we haven't seen these guys playing real badasses mm. for for the for Dwayne Johnson. For We've not seen him play the Terminator. We've not seen him play an evil, villainous monster. We've mm. not seen that. So that's why it works for us with Arnie. We've seen him play that. We've seen him in Conan. We've seen him in, even in Predator. Like he's a good guy, but he's like he's in an eighteen-rated film. Mm. So that's, then placing that, that is it, you know, hot property in a in a classroom with kids and letting comedy play out. Oh, brilliant transition, man. I that just, is that is wonderful. It, yeah. That is, to, to, I think he's he's made the best transitions between different roles because you have him in Terminator and it's like fucking badass role you can't get much like better than that yeah. and then to transition to something like this it's like look at the spectrum of this what this guy can do and he's so lovable and likable in everything he does mm-hmm. and just by transcending between these different roles it just helps so much in like giving the overall picture and a bigger picture of what yes. this guy can do completely we we are seeing it like it, it, he is almost a, a sub genre unto himself, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Mm, you yeah. could just talk, and you're right. This film works only because it's it's Schwarzenegger. Seeing Schwarzenegger go from the roles that that he he was doing to then entering into this classroom and becoming like a father figure to these kids and just softening, mm. reading them stories, playing the banjo, getting them getting them milk, letting them all sleep. He's the protector. That's what his masculine role is. My favourite part of the film point. is when he's training the kids in the fire drill and he's trying to get yeah. them. He's like that level of like, I'm adapting to what I know and I'm putting it towards kids. Yeah. And he works so perfectly and, with them. And police school, man. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That is brilliant. With no more, Mr. Faces. Kimball. I want to go to the bathroom. Nothing. There is no bathroom. I'm a princess, <laughs> not a policeman. <laughs> They're all so shocked. And those kids, right? Kids are normally They're hard. just rubbish hard. in films. Yeah. They, don't, they, they don't act very well or they overact. But these kids felt so natural. That yeah, little girl great. from Beethoven is top notch the when way that got, she is. When she goes to get her bag or something, doesn't she? And he's like... Emma, <laughs> take a toy back to the carpet. But I don't want to go take. Okay, <laughs> so brilliant. I can't get these clips undone. But there's no, there's no funnier line delivered to, for for me than that little boy saying, "My dad is a gynecologist and looks at vaginas all day long." Uh, <laughs> that 
that what well, i'm the amount of times i've seen this film and it always makes me laugh that kid he's great yeah he's funny he's from uh the original pet cemetery i think oh yeah i, I yeah i can see i can picture his face now he's got like a scar on his face uh i can't remember I can see him all proper makeup up <laughs> but yeah i know exactly uh, yeah i can it's, can't yeah, it might be pet cemetery you might be right there but they they all great in in different ways, man. Like some of the you know the ones who have to like Dominic reins it in. He's got a husky voice for a little kid, hasn't he? Dominic, yeah, yeah. Sounds like he's been screaming all night. <laughs> Zach, the the refrained one, the one the one whose whose dad is uh, hitting him. Yeah, and I love I, that. I love that Arnie gets physical only with this guy, not immediately, but only after it keeps happening. Yeah, and the, and the dead teacher's like. What did it feel like? <laughs> yeah, it's like you think, "Fuck, man, this is it. He's gonna get kicked out of the school or something." But no, he's won. He's won him round by then. It's not like all the all the school teachers and whatnot know that they would love to do something like that, but they can't because they yeah. they have to act within the their academic principles. Yeah, when on he's like, "You hit the kid, I hit you." <laughs> <laughs> What's great about this film as well is that. The fact that it tries to pull the wool over your eyes with who the actual um, mother mm-hmm. is and who the kid is, and I've, from I mean now watching it now you can kind of see because they it's really obvious who the kid like they try to introduce him early so it doesn't seem yeah. such a shock when you yes. try to find out who it is. But um, I like it. I like it. Like it could be. It could be one of many, and it, you're trying to you're trying to constantly guess and second guess. Which yeah. one? Which kind of thing? And the motive as well, because you are led to believe that the mother must be some sort of criminal entity herself. Yeah. Since she stole yeah. all the money from Crisp, then you realise that never fucking happened. Crisp, Crisp just—that's brilliant. Chris just made that lie up so that other people would try and track her down to get the mm. money. That, mm. That's very clever. Yeah, that's a clever, clever thing to do. For sure. There was no money, you son of a bitch. <laughs> I liked his uh, partner as well. She's great. She eh? is. Very, she is great. Yeah. I'm trying. Brilliant. What else is she in? Uh, I mean, she just looks very familiar. Pamela Reed. I don't know. She's, been, she's she... in the Bean movie. Oh yeah, she is. She's married to Janosch from uh, Ghostbusters too. Yeah, yeah, she's the mum of the family. Yeah. She's also in Junior as well. Uh, who I brought can't... who along from Junior? Oh Nine yeah, four. she's yeah. Uh, she's Danny DeVito's wife in Junior. You reckon Schwarzenegger brought her along from this because it was in '94? Junior came out. Yeah, that's possible. Mm. All connected. I love. I I just love that uh, Arnie likes to do some comedies in the in the mix with all of this stuff. He isn't just the action star. He's this funny guy, and he's funny also unintentionally. Of course, yeah. It may it might sound a bit like you can't say it, but it's because of his accent and his his awkward grasp of the, the English language that makes it also funny. Yeah, his face is like plasticine. It's like the, the face shapes that you can pull and this know, clip of steel up from like some, some moment in this film and it's like a unique facial expression you've never seen before in your life. That scene, the way they dramatise that scene oh, where he goes great. back into the classroom and all the kids are going mental and slowly the camera pans around <laughs> like pans as around he gets head. angry. <laughs> yes. And that it's is, like his face is slow motion. <laughs> that is brilliant direction, man, for that <laughs> shut up. He delivers it so well. And then he caps it off with all them little shut ups. Shut up, shut up, shut up. And then they will start crying. And he goes, Oh no, not this. <laughs> it's almost like it's almost like one of those like a big reveal in like a thriller or something. Do you know, it's it like is. slowly panning in Tom's face, it's going <laughs> <laughs> What is going on? <laughs> well look, who's behind the helm? Who's behind the camera? Ivan Raitman, man. Come on, of course the guy's not gonna fuck around yeah, with this. Yeah. Very well also, played. Also, when I was watching it though, there are so many of your sample co- quotes in this film and they just sound know, they just ridiculous they like pop out of the screen and i could just hear them they're like in hd compared to everything else it's like yeah yeah especially when you first introduced to the kids like yeah you know, hello how are you yeah yes. that one is just it's ingrained <laughs> in my that, memory who, who is your daddy what yeah. does he do yeah it's classic. just so it's so so good man it's his most quotable movie hands down obviously terminator has the iconic lines but not as many as kindergarten cop mm, mm, yeah and also it was weird watching this movie um 
particularly now living with with someone who works in 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 safeguarding in a school to see even back then they were essentially saying look most of these kids actually have some element of shit going on at, at home and it takes him yeah. going in there to to talk for you to realize oh shit this one's going through divorce this one's dad's abusive this one left and his mum for another man yeah. and it's nice like when when you get that uh the shot of them when they're just standing in in one position it's like they're doing um fucking talking heads yeah and they're great. just saying about what their family life is like and it's it's the innocence portrayed like yeah. of, of quite serious situations it's yes. like that's lovely it's a lovely thing just to see that one of them goes my mom's divorced my dad's divorced <laughs> <It's so brilliant. laughs> the only kids that i don't like are the twins because it's of two obvious humans. Oh, they talk together. Talking together, exactly. Fucking shining. Yes. <laughs> didn't didn't need that. Didn't need that bit. But yeah, but from from the most part, all the kids nail it. It's almost just like kids say the darnest thing. It's like they just. It, yeah. It's not even in the script. Just here, tell me your actual life at home in your own words. <laughs> I, do you know what? He must have done that, don't you yeah. think? For the yeah. most part, to feel so natural must be. The way the little girl talks about the little girl from Beethoven, um, Emma, who talks about uh, her dad being bald and he can't wear any hats. The way she tells that, that can't have been scripted. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Absolutely. If it, it's, it seems so, in any other film, you'd see it's con- like feel so constructed, mm-hmm. like it's like it is just being read from the page, but it does feel off the cuff. Absolutely, here. Yeah. It does. Yeah. And our man, you know, Arnie, all the way through through it, is there for them kids. Like at first, he's reluctant. He's changed. He's there for them kids. He's he's there to be their protector. And at the end, he's fucking wounded, and he's still walking in to protect them. That's the thing that I like. Is at the end, he's coming in. He's wounded. He's on crutches, mm. but he's coming in still to be there. It's not like I've done my job. I'm gone. He comes in. It all comes down to this f- fucking fantastic body being put in this situation yeah, yeah. with these little kids wounded for them coming back in just joyful stuff and it kind of makes sense for his character as well because he's in this he's this hardened police officer who yeah. who can't catch a break he catches the killers and then they get let free and now he can actually he can actually be in a rewarding job yeah where it's like he actually gets he get, actually gets something out of what he's doing for his day to day rather than just putting killers back in they get back out again you ever he feel actually sorry. looks like he loves it do you ever feel yeah. sorry for the original kindergarten teacher who kind of got kicked away and she's just completely forgotten about in this film? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and she's completely now lost her job. Well, I, has she? Because in that last scene, the t- if you see in the background, she's there applauding while I thought Schwarzy that was the Penelope Amela kiss. No, in the background, yeah, in the classroom. Oh, okay. So, but, I, I mean, has he gone back to be a teacher? I just I don't hope know. he does. I think, I I like think that's to, what you're yeah. meant to think. I think he's given up being a policeman officer and he's now a teacher. Yeah. Is that what you call your dad? <laughs> yeah, it's from Hot a Fuzz, policeman isn't officer. it? It's from Hot Fuzz, <laughs> isn't it? A policeman it? officer. He's like, when you can't, you can't say policeman, and he goes, you've got to say police officer, you got to say officer, and he goes, oh, policeman officer. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. But yeah, I think I did feel that as well. It's like she just... She's been let go. Just yeah, like, she's just been completely yeah. put to the side. And, and also, it's like, like, why would you let? And this was her thing at the beginning. It's like the gate. The one of the the, the female officers. She's got a legitimate reason to be a teacher. She's a teacher. You understand that she can go and do it. And they just go, yeah, you can do it. I know, but even there's a point in the film where the headmistress is saying to him. Uh, she says to him, I looked into you. I can find no record of you having taught yeah. anywhere. And then you think she's going to go, so get out. But she's yeah. like, in a way, she's like, you did you did the whistle, which was unorthodox, but it worked. So you brought a ferret in, it worked. Like and she's stuff. like, I don't know what you did before, but you're a very good police. Uh, you're a very good teacher. Mm, mm. Yeah. It's not like he's trying to teach like fucking year six history or something no. it's like it, that you probably need some training to teach that kind of shit also, and have the knowledge in my head as well if he just went around and said oh i'm doing this the teacher might go oh i know about this guy's dad he'll mm. help you mm. Mm. 
that poor teacher though when he walks back in on the crutches and like the whole the whole class is so excited to see him and that teacher's yeah. like these kids never say fucking <laughs> name and that to me I know the reality is most teachers aren't like that other teacher in there just being forgotten about it's like I'm just trying to get through my day but she didn't know how to discipline them because when he came in originally yeah. they were all monsters <laughs> they needed him to come in and straighten them out this is why you need to be able to tell kids to fuck off well, wait say- wait Wait I'd say it. kids are disciplined depending on who's disciplining them. So not necessarily. like The teacher could, just because she's not in the room, it, when she's in the room, they could have felt disciplined. But because they're not there, they're like, oh, let's play up. The teacher's not here. Yeah, that is true. That is true. Um, they're wild. Kids are wild. They're all little oh. shits. Credit to all of them, though. They were, mm. they were great. It, the film could have fallen apart so easily with any of those things, such as the kids being precocious little pricks and then be like, oh, I can't enjoy this. Or yeah. the love interest not being good. But Penelope Ann Miller is great. I've seen, You know, she was awful in something that I watched recently and I realise it's the direction. It's, it's who's in control. It's not mm. she was awful. It was the relic. And she wasn't awful, but you can see what she's like in the hands of a director who doesn't really know what they're doing. But she was Carlito's love interest in Carlito's way. If and she was, was Arnie's she? Oh, she in was, this yeah. and so when you're in the hands of a good director she's doing good I can't actually remember her in Awakenings I didn't realise that she was a love interest for Robert De Niro in there but mm. I think I think she's great she was very beautiful as well it's a shame that she didn't go on to do more because she was like the face of the 90s and then uh, what, she kind of went away I liked yeah. her yeah I liked her very much I would like to say the same for Paula Reed because I think she's fucking wonderful at this yeah film. Just, just the just her whole thing about eating all the time. I think that's fucking great. And it always yeah. keeps coming up. Yes. It's like the running joke through the whole thing. And the fact that she marries a uh, chef. <laughs> chef. And he's like, oh, of course he is. Yeah. <laughs> it's like great. I know. No, so good. Um, she plays a funny sick person. She does. Very realistic sick person in <laughs> yeah. a way as well. Maybe she was <laughs> ill. Just... Yeah, you know when um, towards the end of their car journey in, Arnie's carrying her into the hotel yeah. and he's saying all that stuff in Austrian. Yeah. I was like, I've got to find out what he's saying. And he's saying, that makes me really angry. Now I'm pissed. <laughs> now I'm angry. In Austrian. <laughs> Great stuff. <laughs> but he takes to it very quickly. The next day, he's already suited and booted, ready to go. I he's ready to go. In my mind, there's always a scene where she has to convince him to. Mm. Mm. Yeah, he's, he's a professional. He's a consummate professional. His idea. Although he gets very nervous before he goes in. He's puffing his cheeks out and everything. I love that. We just see this vulnerable side to him in this in a way that we don't yeah. in the others. You know, in in Twins, he's How just a simpleton, but he's still a he's still a big guy. In Junior, he's he's just pregnant. And okay, yeah, he becomes a woman in a way by mm. carrying the, the child to term. But this is the one where it's like, we're going to walk this line between the Arnie you know, shoot him up, beat him up, and this sensitive... Yeah. paternal vulnerable weak figure I, I, it's so feel good I could watch it any time man yeah. I, it's just wonderful you can be masculine and sensitive at the same time yes yeah. and it was a sea change because we lost the whole muscle man thing as the 90s went on in the mainstream at least they were still out there but we didn't get this flood of films where masculinity was all about how big your muscles were in a way mm. he probably signed the death warrant for the Van Dams and the Stallones of the time this is Van Damme has still not moved away from this fucking no. role where we think he has to be the masculine dominating man mm-hmm. no feelings at no. all I know it's just <laughs> can't act but like I say this I think is not so much masculinity in crisis it's like it's let's reframe it it's not oh men are under attack but the, what, what men was is in trouble it's like well no, it's, it's, it's like now this, is, this, this now. is the norm this should be normal for, I, for a man to be like this kind of thing and this is why it's kind of nice doing these yearly look at things because it's like look at we look at the theme of where the world was at the time and mm. what the films were like coming out like it's easy we do it and I do it it's easy now to write or talk about films from 30 40 years ago and criticize them for the way they were but you have to remember the time they were in and it's kind of like watching the film is almost like a window into the time that you were in so when you're watching it it's not just about how you perceive it now but it's like well what does it say about what was going on in the world what were the fears in the world at that point what were people's concerns what were they thinking about mm. and hollywood here is clearly saying it's about men you know, becoming more sensitive, more vulnerable, 
in yeah. a way that they just weren't on screen before. Look, look at Paul and Annie. Well, look, we've already got the theme for this year. See, look at that. Look at what we've got here. How vulnerable is he in that bed? Yeah. The theme is already established, isn't it? I wonder into, the next into s- work. Well, we'll make it. We'll fit it. So we'll make it fit our narrative. I mean, I know for my film it might it, it will work, so it all depends on what Adam's going to pick. Mm. I really don't know what I'm picking still. There's three films in my head. Actually, there's only two films in my head. One of them I've discarded. Like Discipline. You like discipline? Yes, do. I do. Yeah, that's I because do. you haven't thought of your film already. I do. <laughs> well, I've thought of it. I've got two. I'm just weighing it up, depending which I feel. Well, you must be very proud of yourself. I am very proud of myself. Thanks, Arnie. You are disgusting. <laughs> you shouldn't be so uh, proud of yourself, Adam. You are very disgusting. That pride yes! is, is taking you over. Yeah. Thanks, Arnie. I'll always back you. What's up? Nothing much. Let me just say one more thing. I can ask Arnie this question, maybe actually. Um, was it a bit weird when your your partner, your police partner, kisses you in the hospital bed on the lips? Yeah. I mean, it, it was pretty weird, right? Especially when your husband's just about to walk in the room. Yes. No elaboration. <laughs> Come on, you have to keep talking. He can't hold up the whole conversation himself. <laughs> Uh, that's all I had to say about that. <laughs> he wants to carry on the conversation, but it's a two-way dialogue. <laughs> You're not a sound machine. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> He's the one who needs to pause for a minute. I just felt like it was a little bit out of the blue. It's like, yes, she was. She she grew to like him. They were they were a bit bit on rocky path at the beginning. But then going the full hog and just giving him a smacker on the lips, it's like, it, just, it was a bit out of the blue. This may sound strange, but I'm looking for someone that lived here a long time ago. Oh, well, the second half of that made no sense. <laughs> <laughs> the most important thing is money. Yeah, so that's why he did it. He was like, I know this is a problem, but I need to get paid. Oh, well, yeah. It was, if it was part of the script, you just This is to. my job. Yeah, it exactly. is your job, He's an actor, Arnie. So. You're an actor, so you just do what's done on the... Uh, just you, do well, it. You do what's on the just script, but it. also, yeah, I feel like you go above and beyond what's on the script because most of it is in your just your body language, Schwarzenegger. You, oh, I'm not interested in that. Well, you must betray it without even realising because... It doesn't matter. So are you just saying to me that you just do what's on the script. You do nothing else to try and make a better performance using your own acting skills. I'm sorry. Maybe you're not as legendary as you thought you were, Arnie. I hear you. You hear me? <laughs> how at are last, you? At lo- how are-, <laughs> are you saying how are you or I hear you? <laughs> he said I hear you. Oh. At last, Arnie has been seen for what he truly is, an actor who doesn't and act. And what's that? An actor who doesn't act and just reads Ooh. from the script. Bastard. <laughs> well, Bitch. You revealed it, Arnie. I'm sorry. Bullshit. He's angry. He's been revealed. Can He's someone tell me? I don't know where this conversation's going anymore. <clears throat> Absolutely. This time you can count on me. See, see, <laughs> it all uh, deteriorates in the end. <laughs> um, have you got anything else to say about this? Film? I don't think I've got too much more to say about it. It just it mm. speaks for itself as a beautiful fucking film, and uh, I encourage anyone who thinks back on it and was like, "Yeah, I enjoyed it, but I didn't get much out of it." Revisit the thing because it just brings so much joy. It's just yeah. the perfect that I couldn't improve it. And Ivan Reitman, what a guy! What a guy! He even put his son in. That cameo scene, uh, kissing the girl in the room on the second floor when Arnie busts in when there's a fire going on towards the end. That's Jason right now. Oh, okay. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's nice. Keeping the family. Yep. He also put him in Ghostbusters too as well. Of course he did. Would you wish he put you in a film? Uh, he would struggle to do so now since he's dead, but yes, I would have liked to. I wish to. he had. I did wish he had. I wish that I'd met him. Hmm. I, hang on, sorry. I just realised I didn't even realise this. Uh, I just had to check his um, 
directorial, but he was also responsible for Twins and Junior. What, Ivan, Ivan Reitman. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. So that's a, a good trilogy of uh, comedies with uh, Arnie there. Maybe he brought uh, Phoebe O'Hara into Junior. Mm. I would the, say um, Junior is the weakest of the three. What, what, where would you place out of the three Arnie comedies? Uh, yeah, this is top. Yeah, then Twins, uh, then Junior. Yeah, I probably agree, yeah. What about you, Adam? I haven't seen Junior, but I'll put this top and then Twins. Him and Danny in Twins is, is so good. Mm. Got a love a bit of Danny. Yeah, again, just leads into the whole thing of like the opposite of me. But even though I'm the big hulking guy, I'm the sensitive one. The one yeah. who's little and not the traditional yeah, view of ideal syndrome. masculinity is the horrid one. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, you guys go ahead, give your scores. Why not? Okay, let's do it in the order we did our first impressions, I guess. Yeah. I'm giving this a very great 8 out of 10. Oh, great eight. Why did I think that you gave it a nine or a ten as well? No, it's always been uh, an eight for me. Well, as always, for me, this is a ten. I said it was a ten. It's a ten. And uh, you did that in an Arnie voice. Well, there you go. <laughs> oh, he loved it. So the first time <laughs> I watched this film, I gave it a six. Second time I watched it, I gave it a seven. And this time, I'm going to give it. An eight. Jesus, Bullshit. you give it an eight? Bullshit. I don't believe you. Bullshit. I was thinking about Bullshit. it when we were doing this. Bullshit. I was like... Bullshit. <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> he, don't, he ain't buying it, Adam. Well, I'm fucking fighting on it. I would have understood if you gave it a seven again, but eight seems... No, I yeah, I was thinking... like you like it this much. Crust, crust of a seven, but like I said, I can't. if I can't really think of a negative and everything's good, then it is an eight. Well, look at the convincing Everything display okay, that's been had. It would be a seven. See, this is why it's worth arguing for things that you uh, you like because it raises it. Because this guy would have left that as a six. Oh, do you know? Do you know what that actually does? Makes it the top film of all time. Brings it into the top twenty of all time. <gasps> does it? Yes. <laughs> How on earth has that happened? It's probably it's got an like 8. an eight seven. Yeah. Oh yeah, but it might not it actually because we've got, it's got to go up against Doctor Sleep. Well, that's very true. You, that's very true. It has to go up against Doctor Sleep, and I will say, it obviously, does not beat Doctor Sleep for me. It beats Doctor Sleep for me. So here we go, Adam. God. Be honest. I know that Doctor Sleep is the one for you. So that's that. There's no way you're saying this beats Doctor Sleep unless you've I'm had. Say a... Doctor Sleep is better. Yeah. Look how close it came. It almost got into the top twenty. We've been knocking. But I'd rather 20... rewatch this tomorrow than I would Doctor Sleep. Well, it's, a very, it's a very long, long one to watch yeah. as well. It's, on yeah. your Letterboxd uh, stats, since you've been logging on Letterbox, this is now probably your most rewatched movie, is it? I watched it three times. So. Yeah, it probably is. <laughs> yeah. Mad Max is top and Whiplash are top with like five and six. Wow. I watched Uncut Gems four times. I was like, the fuck? God, why? I don't really know, to be honest. So many films have almost got into our top 20 literally the past three episodes it feels like and they keep just eking out just on that 21 spot we're up to 150 now i think it should be a top 25 nah, maybe we should extend i don't know considering how many films we've got i don't know maybe we should extend it i mean Listen. it's already extended to tw bottom 10 bottom 20 and top 20 so let's leave it until we get to 200 then we can extend it We'll do 25, top 25 and bottom 25 by the time we get to 200. And then we delete the bottom 25. Yeah, from existence. Remove them from existence. <laughs> we delete them off all streaming services. Can you believe we've been talking about all these fucking films? God, who's listening to us? We're going through all these films, just talking, talking. <laughs> well, that's very nice that it could have made it close. It almost touched the, the stars. Yes. I think, I mean, looking at the other things that are in the top 20, obviously there's a few stinkers in there but generally speaking can't argue with it it's always it's, going to be top tier for I especially considering that we thought Adam didn't like this film as much as I know. he apparently I know. does could, yeah. have, could have fired I mean, I know, I know, just because I gave it I think it's because I gave it a 6 initially you just saw that as hate it's not terribly low if I gave it a 4 I could understand you coming for me there's only certain shit films that I'll give a 4 out of 10 
at the moment in our top 20 for those who care and by the way the film that is below kindergarten cop is true romance listeners as you all know from the last episode scott voted that high so it almost broke the top 20 but in our top 20 films of all time adam has six picks six films he's picked and i've got two and our audience have one our audience is jamie Mm. And Paul, you are one out of kindergarten. Out. I have a feeling, and I have the faith, actually, that should our patrons ever need to assign a score to a film, I think there's some love out there for Kindergarten Cop that might just see that bump up into the top 20. Yeah, potentially. I, I could see it. I could see it. It could be coming. Well, should we see some love that uh, our listeners have got for Kindergarten Cop? Let's see what they got to say. So first of all, we've got Luke Human, and he says, a horribly overrated, tonally bizarre Fucking action hell. comedy that at least showed off some of Arnie's skill for humour. Good for the sequences in class and Hunt's and Reed's performances, but dull turn of the decade action tropes means, aside from the N-word, this hasn't aged well. Apart from they the N-word. The N-word. They N- dropped the Nostalgia. N-word. Oh. <laughs> About to say. Again, apart from the apart from the N word, <laughs> we're the ones who came up with that. Remember? Then? <laughs> I mean, I massively disagree, Luke. But I don't know what you mean by the dull turn of the decade action tropes. I guess there's a just a few beats that fall in line with endings, like at the end. But I didn't think it was dull. I thought it worked very well. Mm. That's very hard from Luke Human. It's really harsh. The lovely Tonally film. bizarre. I say, I say the tone, the way it shifts tone is to its credit. Yeah, I'd say so. The way mm. that it mixes the humour with the action and wow. Dull turn of the day. Maybe, maybe Luke likes masculinity in all its muscular form. Maybe. That's his kind not, of action. Not bogged down by sentimentality or parental responsibility. Just give me the guns. Give, give me, me the guns. The, give me the oil duck. In every biceps. sense of the word. <laughs> yeah. All the guns. Make them oily and make them shiny. As oily as they can be. Dylan, you son of a bitch. Um, next up, we have Sean Panda Nicholson. And he says, yes. I really hope the man himself makes an appearance. Well, I hope he didn't make too much of an appearance and ruin the he definitely, flow he definitely of the... definitely made an appearance, though. Yes. <laughs> Come I like, on. I like the film, by the way. Apart from Jingle All The Way, this is one of Arnie's masterpieces. A f- highlight for me is when he runs outside and screams. <laughs> Pitch perfect comedy from A. Schwartz. Yeah, look at that. A lot of love. Yeah, <laughs> he just needs to leave the school to let out that. Yeah. yeah. And it echoes. <laughs> you know what's funny about Jingle All The Way is that's about a man obsessed with getting a toy for his son and oh, then you've yeah, got that yeah. moment with Chris being like yeah. I need to get this toy for you my son they saw that bit and thought fuck it that's a whole film there yeah let's <laughs> extend it let's extend it <laughs> oh it's me uh, Mark from Movie Drone saying a film I love but refuse to watch on TV as they censor the crap out of it so the quote what did it feel like to hit that son of a bitch becomes SOB and then becomes completely muted by far the most quotable Arnie film Hashtag bring out that soundboard. It's true. I can't stand these TV edits, man. So stupid. And I told you, that. did I mention this on the podcast? I watched Terminator 2 several months ago on ITV just because it was on. And the soundtrack's different, isn't it? No, no. They pitched it up by 1.25. So everything is sped up because it's really? like, we need to, we, yeah, we need to maximize our time. We'll say Terminator 2's on, but we can't have it taken up two and a half hours. So it's 1.25 sped up. It was horrible. Oh, it was horrible. Unwatchable. That's Absolutely weird. Unwatchable. Yes. Mm, I'm very odd. Next, we have Mr. Scott Redding, who appeared last on our episode about Halloween Ends, and he says, one of the best childhood films that's also quite disturbed and violent towards the end. Ha <laughs> ha, but a classic. There you go. It does get very violent at the end. Last of all, we have Ryan Repulse. Repulsive. Repulsive, yeah. <laughs> Ryan Repulsive. And he says, it's been a very long time since I saw this film, and I remember bug all about it. My favourite early films are Commando and The Running Man. Total Recall is also great. Uh, so, Total Recall is not also great. It is great. Yes. It is like the great, one of the greatest of the great. But you should probably rewatch this, Ryan. Yes. I mean, I'm hoping you did by the time you got to this part of the podcast. Yeah. Because we've just... This I on mean, Netflix. Go you, for it. It doesn't matter about spoiling, I guess, if you've watched it before. But, you know, you might as well give it a rewatch. You might as well give it a rewatch. Right. 
that's the end of Kindergarten Cop. Adam, would you like to tell us what we're doing next on the podcast? Oh, oh man, man, man. Oh, I still don't know. All right. So I was going to go for something I hadn't seen before for this year, but I couldn't really think. So there's a film I haven't seen in so long that I pretty much don't remember it. So it'd almost be a fresh watch. It involves one of Ben's favourite people and it involves one of Paul's favourite people. And that film... All right, hold on, hold on there. Don't say it. Let's try and work this out, Paul, without looking at Letterboxd. So you're Nicolas Cage, I would say. And I would go with De Niro or Pacino, but I have no idea when either of those acted in a film together. Hmm. Oh, 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 I know what it is. I know what it is. You got half and of I'm it right, s- didn't you? I'm s- yes, I did get half of it right. I'm very glad you've picked this because I was potentially going to pick it, but decided not to. Go ahead and announce I really, it. I really want to rewatch it. Um, and the so film is Wild at Heart. Excellent. Oh, Excellent. wonderful. Great. Yeah, I was gonna, just for the record, I was going to pick Rocky V, but I thought that's way too far down the franchise. to. That's the next film it, that I need to watch. Do it justice. And I feel like... <laughs> We'd be a bit too harsh on it and do it, but and the other film I was going to pick to keep it in theme was Predator Two. No, oh, I'm right. glad you didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great pick. Good one. Nice. Very good pick. Come on, Mr. David Lynch. He's returning to the podcast again. Again. Yeah, I haven't. It was like I feel like it's going to be basically a fresh watch for me. I haven't watched this film in so long. Neither have I, to be honest. I've, I think I've only watched it once, so I look forward to that. Very good, very good. Right. Should we move on to what our patrons have to say this week? What have they got to say? The patrons, I mean. Right, so just as a perk, our patrons, they get to basically tell us what they've been watching every week. And we get to tell everyone what not to watch and what to watch, the good and the bad of the film world. And you can do it if you become a patron at www.patreon.com forward slash filmbusters and become a patron just like the likes of our newest patron, Mr. Francis Ciberini. Thank you so much for joining. Yes, Francis has also joined the likes of Andy Bishop. Uh, who has joined the likes of Ben from Film Floggers. Who has joined the likes of Mark and Steve from Movie Drone. They've joined the likes of a whole podcast, The Home Video Hustle. Who have joined the likes of Luke Human. Who have joined the likes of Whacking Phoenix fan Fiona Stewart. Who have joined the likes of our, one of the people who wrote in recently, Sean Pano Nicholson. Who have joined the likes of that Texas Albuquerque superstar Nerd Revert. Who have joined the likes of the contrarian superstar Julio. Who have joined the likes of Jamie Russell, who's picked this year. Who have joined the likes of Australia's Kiki Nuki. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know what happened there. Right, first of all, Julio has some fresh things for us. Finally watch Rear Window. It suffers from having been remade and reimagined in ways that are more engaging than its original incarnation, but it's still pretty solid and even more impressive when you consider it in context of its release. Biggest plot hole, who wouldn't abandon everything for Grace Kelly? Well, for sure. For sure, he, Julio. He, he's on a uh, Hitchcock run at the moment because they've just been doing the uh, Psycho. Psycho, The original yeah. Psycho and Psycho remake on there. Mm. Their channel. I agree with the rear window thing. I just don't, don't think it holds it's the, up. It's one of the, it's the, one of the best. Oh, you don't think it holds up these days? I still no. think it holds up. It's fucking great. Uh, apart from the initial concept, mm. seeing all of their windows, that's it. Well, true. Yeah. He also got a rotten one for us. He says, Oh man, I was really excited to see Winona Ryder had a new movie out, but Gone in the Night was hilariously bad. Not Winona's fault, of course, except for the fact that she decided to be in the movie. Just a <laughs> weak story that gets sillier and sillier the longer it goes on. Well, I don't know what that's about. Never heard of it in my life. But don't watch it, people. No. Um, we now hear from Katie and Oti. And they say, I will be putting a very low rating or letterbox for the new Billy Inchin film. Bros. Eichner. Eichner film. Bros. Lot of nonsense to my thoughts. Nuance. Lot of nuance to my thoughts. Nonsense. That's why I was a bit like <laughs> Lot of nuance to my thoughts, but just need to know that I have a lot of foundational qualms, quarrels, and quandaries. I don't even know what that is. Bros? Do I? A lot of people have been talking about it at the London Film Festival, but that oh, doesn't okay. mean nothing. Everyone's been creaming their knickers over it, which probably oh, means it is bad. Yeah, they love it. But Katie and Oti don't like it, so that's who we listen to. We won't be watching it. 
Okay, Luke Human has hit us with uh, his high pick, which is 2022's Blonde. Now, I've got to preface Ooh. this by saying I think this is the only person I've heard of that enjoyed this film because it's been getting so much hate. Oh, so let's yeah. hear, hear what Luke's got to say. There is a need and expectation to bring what we already know about Marilyn to this film. Much like 21 Spencer, what we get is fiction built around a persona and hung on historical fact that explores trauma and mental illness exacerbated by fame and the lack of control that accompanies it. The Armas gives an incredible performance, giving us everything we want as Marilyn and showing brilliant range as Norma Jean, clearly relishing the challenge. Weighty themes deepen the audience experience and will, at some point, challenge almost every viewer. The purported graphic nature of some scenes is grossly overstated and it's to Dominic's credit that none of it appears gratuitous. Mm. Aside from a single jarring misstep, the direction is focused yet eclectic, helping along with great score to set mood, tone and emotion while maintaining our interest for the long run time. An excellent exploration of one of the most well-known, least known 20th century icons. Nine out of ten. That is high as a motherfucker. I've got People halfway been... through it and I've stopped watching it. Oh, really? Just because mm. I got pulled away from it and I have no desire to really go back to it. It's not... Oh, at shit. the moment, I wouldn't say it's terrible. It's just weird. And it's like, the, I don't know what oh, they're weird. trying to achieve with it. Well, that's, that sounds like a good endorsement of it. I, I, there's only one clip I've seen of it, which is her, her own fetus in her belly that I believe oh, she's going to abort, talking to her, saying, please don't. All, all oh, that's wow. happened in the film so far for me is she just keeps getting abused, like sexually abused and stuff. It's, I don't know what they're trying to achieve with it is the kind of thing. That's the problem. Mm. Anna's all right in it, but I don't know what else is actually going on around it. I'm just surprised that it's got so much hate and that Anna Darmus would be in it if it was such a... Yeah. a uh, terrible movie I mean this is from the director of Chopper and Assassination of Jesse James which are both absolute top tier fucking films yeah yeah absolutely so you've well, piqued I'm, my I'm interest enough it, yeah definitely yeah. Same. I mean it is that is long though that's the problem it's almost three hours and I'm like ugh yeah it's a chore you, yeah I also he says I also paid good money to see and he says Mike Myers, but I shall say Michael Myers, in what will probably be his last appearance for a while. I don't resent spending eight quid to support horror at the cinema, but I do resent the fact that some great ideas for the franchise were executed so clumsily. I'm with Adam on this. It is not a well-made film. I also couldn't get over the fact that no one looked for an extremely wanted mass murderer in the sewer room for four years. Glad the rest of you enjoyed it, though. Yes, we did. You heard the episode, Luke. I've said all I have to say on the damn matter. And that's all I have to say about that. He won't be going back into it. I can totally <laughs> see why people would dislike it. Like I said, I feel yeah. I feel less inclined to defend this one than I did with Kills because with Kills, it was completely like, what are you people smoking that you can't see how great this is? Whereas for this one, I can see it being divisive. So I won't argue the point. I would just <laughs> say, I loved everything, baby. So glad you did. And I'm glad I did too. That's everyone. And that is the end of the podcast. So now you can either look forward to hearing us talk about what lick film, Adam? Forward. Wild lick forward. I said it wrong. I didn't think you'd understand or hear it. But I said lick Adam, forward. A Adam just called his film Wider Height as well. Did I? Mm. Wild at Heart. <laughs> Yes, Wild at Heart by Mr. David Lynch. Or you could come over and listen to our Patreon episode, which we're about to record right now, which is the top five female antagonists of all time in our opinions. Mm. So yeah. do one of those things, and we'll see you later. See you later. See you Thanks later, for listening to Arnie. Alligator. It's